So let's talk just a little bit about something that to me is very personal. I know it isn't to everyone, but I think it's really interesting. Uh, if you look at the CO2 emissions from fossil fuel burning, tons per person per year, this is from 2006. So it's a little bit out of date. The good news is we're not number one, but we're close. We emit about something close to 20 tons of carbon per person per year on average. Uh, Europeans about half as much as we do. And if you look at these countries down at the bottom here, is countries like Bangladesh and Ethiopia, Chad, they don't emit very much. I'm going to come back to that. Why do we do it? A third is the energy industry, a third is roughly transportation, and a third is pretty much everything else, including things like fuel and stuff like that in your house. Um, so these are really important things. You know, it's not like underarm deodorant, which, yeah, it's important, but you can use the stick, right? Um, these are things that people feel they're attached to, and they perceive that solutions to them are not practical. There's a lot of debate about that, of course. Um, let's, let's talk about these countries on the bottom. And so I'm going to just turn that graph around. I'm going to show you the ratio of our American per person emission to that of the other countries. And so we emit, on average, about 1,000 times more per person per year than people who emit that. About 200 times more, say, than people who and an average Ethiopian village is something like 150 to 200 people. So every one of us is our own little Ethiopian village. Um, people who live like this just don't emit carbon. Or people who live like this, or people who live like that. And that's really the crux of the issue. Because on average right now, there are about 6 billion people in the developing world. And they're emitting something like five times less fossil carbon per person than the other one billion who are lucky enough to live in the developed world. So the fundamental problem is what about those people's future? If they develop as we develop, this world is going to get very hot. Well, MIT 10 years ago said it had a very special obligation uh, to address the challenges in energy and environment. Susan Hockfield said that at her uh, inaugural address. Mighty was born uh, not too much after. I'll show you the timeline in just a minute. Um, and we did not produce uh, an environment initiative at that time. Here's the, what the timeline actually looked like. Um, so Mighty uh, was uh, created in September of 2006, about a year after the Energy and Environment Statement. Um, there were then report after report after report on what we could do, what we should do. And in 2014, um, I was asked to be the founding director of the uh, MIT Initiative on the Environment by President Wright. And it's, uh, it's not something I came here to do. Um, I uh, don't really uh, consider myself an, an administrator. And as you can probably tell, I love science. And anything that takes me away from science, I also love teaching. Uh, anything that takes me away from that is some of the things that you know, I really have to do because I feel a duty to do them. And I do feel a duty to do this um, because I really think that we have a tremendous capability at MIT, a unique capability to build a fantastic program. So it's not been very long since the initiative was announced. I can't give you a chapter and verse of what it's going to look, going to look like. I can mainly only just tell you about a vision. And it's based on the kinds of things that, I, that I've just been telling you. Um, the reports that were produced talk a lot about our strengths. We have fantastic strengths in all of these areas, and I'm sure many of you worked on them in your uh, in the graduate work, and, and more, actually. We also have tremendous strength in economics, including environmental economics. We also have some strength in policy analysis, which is unsurpassed. We also have tremendous strength in clean tech, green chemistry, and engineering. We have, actually, a very uh, interesting active uh, set of things going on in new media, public opinion, environment, and health. So these yellow bits are all the things that I think need to be integrated with these other bits. And really the question is, how to build new connections which will lead to real solutions like the interdisciplinary connections that led to the solutions that I talked about earlier. That's what I want to do. And I want to do it in a very open way. Um, so the initiative is I just have to say, is not here to replace the very strong disciplinary programs that exist in all of these areas. The initiative uh, is something that, as long as I'm doing it, is going to try to build something very different that is far more interdisciplinary and fast work. 
So I've been saying this since I was uh, asked to do this job, and here's uh, the kind of statements that, that I've made. Um, and you've seen my justification for this part of the statement. Um, you know, the federal agencies do a wonderful job of funding disciplinary work and getting, getting enough resources to do something really interdisciplinary. It's very, very hard in my experience. So that's what we want to do, and we put out our uh, request for proposals uh, to faculty. I hope that uh, some of the advisors are busy writing proposals. They're due November 20th, uh, and we'll be announcing our awards in February and March. Um, and uh, basically, we want to uh, make sure that everybody has a fair chance to, uh, to be engaged across every school of, of this institution. So I'm not going to give you any more details on what I think this initiative should be that would be a mistake. I just sent a message that I already have in my email. I absolutely do not. The only thing that I might have about is that the disciplinary work is special. We've got to try to do it in a special way. We're also going to have uh, some, some activities in education. I would love to hear your ideas about those. Uh, undergraduate minor in environment, or possibly a uh, uh, minor in sustainability, as we mentioned. We would love to expand all of the course offerings, so your thoughts about that would be welcome. And uh, I apologize for taking so much time, but we have a little few minutes left. So maybe we can take an extra five minutes. Yeah, sure. Great. Thank you very much. So as mentioned, we, are not, we will now open the floor for questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and I will bring the microphone to you. And before you ask your question, please state your name and the department that you are from. Hi, my name is Leo. I'm a mechanical engineering. I'm, I'm not an expert in climate change, but when I do think about it, it seems daunting. I, I, I sometimes come to the conclusion that we should be switching to nuclear energy. Just wondering what your thoughts are on that. It, it seems maybe not like a silver bullet, but something quite useful. Yeah, let me just say something I forgot to say, which is a big challenge with climate change, and sort of implied by what we talked about, is that the actions of the individual person, you know, even a spray deodorant or a stick, you know, are, 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 we don't have anything like that. We don't have anything simple that we all can do. Because let's face it, we're all, you know, I'm going to go home, I'm going to get the train, I need to drive. That's about the best I can manage. It's not going to make up for the fact that I'm still in Ethiopian village all by myself, right? So, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with those kind of actions, but they don't solve the problem. But the only way to solve the problem is by changing the energy system. That's good. I'm not against nuclear. I'm not uh, for or against anything. I guess my view is that uh, we don't know enough yet to pick winners and losers in the energy system. Um, we simply uh, have to let, I think, all the, I have let a thousand flowers bloom and see how they, they each come out. Uh, nuclear poses some special challenges, both in terms of citizen engagement, as you, as you know very well, um, but, but also in terms of, uh, I would have to say, in terms of structures and, and management of the process so that people are comfortable that it's safe. We learned that pretty well uh, with Fukushima. So, uh, if we're going to go that route, we need a different approach to international standards and international checking. It won't solve the problem of, you know, the renegade state, but at least, you know, the states that, that are uh, want to be careful can, can have a, a more uniform approach. Hello, uh, my name is Jeffrey Supran. I'm a sixth year grad student in material science and engineering. Um, you mentioned how environments and social movements in the past have um, kick-started major shifts in society, um, but obviously when it comes to climate change, we're not doing a very good job yet. Um, and in President Wright's announcement of your appointment as the founding director of the ESI, he also mentioned um, the launch of this campus-wide climate change conversation. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment on what opportunities that might present for, for us as a community. Well, I think it's a tremendous opportunity. Um, I'm really glad that we're doing it. I think we ought to uh, make sure that in looking at every aspect of what we do and how it can actually help with, uh, with this issue. Um, that includes education, by the way. I hope that uh, you me and the young will spend some, some significant time thinking about that. Um, you know, the areas that we can contribute to are, are extensive. I, I kind of goes back to my, uh, my slide of, of all the areas that, that need to be drawn together. We have a huge capacity, all the people 
think it is. So figuring out how to build the connections is something that individual faculty will be doing as a result, hopefully, of the request for proposals that, that we just put out. Um, and it's hopefully something that your committee will be helping to guide as well. And I'm really looking forward to what you come up with. Uh, my name is Saad. I'm a second year PhD student uh, in material science. Um, so uh, sorry to go over climate change again, but uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the key issues or uh, sort of debates on how to cut your, cut carbon dioxide emissions, right, um, is to uh, you know have a system like uh, you know uh, taxes for carbon dioxide or caps, uh, uh, or you know like uh, disinvest from uh, fossil fuel companies or companies that emit a lot of carbon dioxide uh, and you know sort of implement these uh, scenarios and let market forces uh, decide how 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 best to you know cut down emissions um, what do you think is sort of the right way to go about in terms of cutting carbon dioxide emissions i mean do yeah do you have a say on i'm not one of these guys you know i'm not an economist so my opinion isn't really worth much um, all i can tell you is that the advantage of the cap is Know how much you want to do. We'll make, we'll set the cap. We had a plan for waxing market that we have set a cap, and then you let the market forces decide uh, how to implement the cap. Of course, some kind of allocations and trading, and there's all kinds of interesting questions about how how you allocate the permits, how you auction them, how you give them away. Uh, there's a tremendous number of issues that. Really know that stuff and work very hard. So that's kind of a, you know a huge advantage. The uh, the, the other uh, way to go is a tax, uh, which doesn't set a cap. It just sets the you know as things get more expensive, less will be used. I guess my biggest concern is is that whatever we do is uh, should be fair to the consumer and not just a mechanism to have more profits go to you know the energy companies, even if they're solar energy companies. <laughs> Um, so the, the, the advantage of the tax, as you know, people like Jim Hansen would say, is that you can have a tax in which you give the, um, the, the dividends, you give the, the income directly back to the people, rather than having it go to, say, you know, uh, something like R&D for energy research. Well, you know, that's a decision that we'll have to make. I don't have an informed enough opinion to be the person you ought to be asking about this. I can't tell you that cap and trade uh, has achieved some significant successes on past environmental issues, and to, to my eye, one of the, the, the biggest ones is uh, in some areas in fisheries, where they set a cap on, for example, lobstering in Maine, and because it's a community that actually believes in what they're doing and is able to talk to each other, they actually make it work. Um, they haven't depleted the lobster, the lobster fishery in Maine the same way it has in some other places. So that's a good example of how cap and trade can actually work. Um, but there's plenty of examples where it doesn't work so well. So I, I don't think there's a, an easy answer. I'm probably wasting more time with stuff that other people on this campus know a lot more about than me. You should talk to them about. Good evening. Josue Lopez from Electrical Engineering. Uh, you sh demonstrated how the U.S. has been the leader before in terms of some environmental issues. Uh, do you know from talking to your colleagues why the roles have flipped or what kind of combination of a lot of political, scientific, and environmental factors made that switch? Because it's been very dramatic and very apparent. Um, and how you perceive like, the role what you know you can pinpoint to, if, if any, well, about that Well, really, really should take my class, because that's what a lot of it is about. But to give you uh, some aspects of an of a, you know, elevator speech kind of answer, I would first of all say that this sort of public interest is always a pendulum on any issue. It swings one way, and then it swings back. And so we've, we've had, a, to some extent, a reaction uh, that, that was in, in uh, response to the tremendous successes that we had in the 70s. To some extent, you could almost forecast that they would be followed by uh, a period in the 80s and 90s that, that were different. 
Um, but another another big factor clearly was uh, the, the rise of the interest in small government, uh, the uh, anti-regulation movement that occurred, and that really actually began under President Carter. So that it began to be a, a, a weapon that could be used against all kinds of things, probably very different from what Carter had in mind, I suspect. Um, but it became a social movement of its own that, uh, frankly, has gone in the opposite direction. Personally, though, I'm really encouraged because I, I think that's that, I think that younger people have a somewhat different feeling about that, that social movement. And certainly, if you want to name a good example of where deregulation has worked so well, you can talk about the deregulation of the banks and the incredible economic catastrophe that was you know, barely averted in 2008. You know. So we're living through a period now of uh, recovery from a huge mistake of excessive deregulation. And I think people understand that. People are beginning to realize that sometimes regulations are actually really important and helpful to to ordinary people, you know, and there's beginning to be a feeling that uh, that the way that government has been run for the last um, well, through the last 35 years um, has not been fair to all the people, and should be fair. President Obama says that, and I agree. With we have time for one last question. Be patient. The pendulum is swinging, but help it swing. Hi, um, my name is Julie Kirby, and I'm in the Department of City Planning. Um, I had a question about what advocacy role you see your office playing both within the university in terms of advocating for change and how we could be better on climate change, um, but then also more broadly making those connections between research to actual action in industry or in government, um, because we can do all the research in the world, but if we're not connecting that beyond the institution, it's not going to make a big difference. Well, you know, that's a really uh, interesting question. Like other initiatives, this initiative has to be primarily focused on research. And in order to be credible in research, I think that really limits what you can do in activism. So I, I would argue that that isn't the role of this initiative. There are other entities on campus that have that role, and initiatives are not one of them. Yeah, that's why I prefer to be well, thank you so much, Professor Solomon. Please join me in thanking Professor Solomon for such an amazing experience. Professor Solomon, may I have a small gift for you? the end of the lecture. I mean, if you, if you have received an email from me regarding the dinner, it means that you have been selected for the dinner with the speaker, so please meet me at the back of the room. And just one last announcement, we will be having one more lecture this semester. It will be by Bill Albert, from, who is the director of the MIT Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship. So please stay tuned for further announcement. Thank you.